We're talking today with Greg Larabelle of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, uh, Greg, you can begin with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in uh, Grand Rapids, St. Mary's, at uh, November 2nd, 1944. Okay. Now, did you grow up in Grand Rapids, or did you move around? Yes, I grew up, uh, went to uh, St. Francis uh, grade school, Catholic Central High School, and, uh, and then into the Air Force. Okay. And what was your family doing for a living when you were a kid? My, my dad was the uh, yard master of C&O Railroad, uh, and my mom worked various uh, part-time jobs, but mm -hmm. she was mostly a stay-at-home, uh, raising six kids. Okay. Uh, now, had your dad been in the service, or was he a little older? Or? Yeah, he was in World War II, uh, Army Air Corps. Uh, never went overseas, but was stationed in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Indian Town Gap, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a, a prisoner of war uh, camp. Okay. Did they ever talk about any of the experiences there? No, but he did uh, write a journal, and he's got, uh, I have a journal of his that he wrote for one year mm -hmm. when he went in and uh, while he was at Indian Town Gap. So it's pretty interesting. Okay. All right. So uh, basically, when you after you graduated high school, you joined the Air Force? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and what led to that decision? Well, my dad was uh, an amateur radio operator and fixed radios and TVs for everybody in the neighborhood and everybody in his circle of friends. And um, I always was interested in, in electronics, so I thought uh, I would go into the Air Force and, and learn electronics, and fortunately, uh, you never know what you're going to do when you go in the Air Force. But I scored high in, in electronic aptitude, and I was put into uh, autopilot systems. Okay. Uh, so when do you actually join the Air Force? October, of, October 10th, 1962. Okay. Uh, and once you sign up, now what happens to you? Then I go to uh, Detroit and uh, take my physical, and uh, from there we go to Lackland Air Force Base. Okay. Uh, now, was the physical a fairly serious one or a fairly cursory one? No, it seemed cursory. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of guys that uh, rejected for flat feet, uh, uh, asthma and so on, but uh, it was kind of a routine Mm -hmm. I was in pretty good shape from running cross country. Mm -hmm. Okay, because uh, it, it was probably a different atmosphere in 1962 than it would have been in 66 or 68 with Vietnam going on. Right. At this point, people who were there, probably most of them wanted to be there. Right, that's correct. It was okay. pretty much volunteer. Yeah, all right. Uh, so where is Lackland? Lackland is in San Antonio, Texas. Okay, and how did they get you down there? Uh, we went by train, uh, let's see, what did we go by train, and uh, went, uh, yeah, all the way. And what do you remember my, about that train my ride? My first train ride. Okay. My dad worked for the c &O Railroad for years and years, and I had never been on a train uh, other than on an engine looking at it, mm -hmm. but I had never been on a train ride, and okay. so that was my first experience. How long did it take to get down there? A uh, couple of days at least. Uh, I don't remember a whole lot about it, but uh, it took a couple of days. Okay. So you get down to Lackland, and then what happens once you arrive? Then they start yelling at you, and uh, you go through the routines, and you go through getting your uniforms and uh, getting yelled at again, and then uh, going doing a lot of paperwork and a lot of yelling. and. Uh, Finally, you get to your, your dormitories and uh, meet your technical drill sergeants and uh, start going through the procedures. Okay. So what did Air Force basic training consist of when you were there? It was, I, I look back at it, it's pretty easy. Um, it was eight weeks. We had uh, our uh, obstacle course which uh, I can remember going through the obstacle course and going ahead of my flight and into the next flight. And uh, when I got through, 
I kind of got my butt chewed for uh, going too fast. I had ran cross country in high school, and so it was pretty easy jumping over obstacles and going into the water, and uh, I just enjoyed doing it. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I was doing it too uh, enthusiastically. All right. Uh, <clears throat> and how much emphasis do they put on discipline following orders? Well, that's where they, they break you down. They, you want to become a team member mm -hmm. as opposed to an individual. And so uh, it's a daily routine of shining your shoes, shining the floor, making sure your bed is, uh, can bounce a dime off of it. Um, all of these insignificant things uh, are all part of a disciplined team building and uh, putting you into a, a group of, of men that are all doing the same thing for now. Uh, and that's, I think that's what, one of the most important things about basic training. Okay, now, did you understand that at the time or figure that out later? Not really, uh, you, you wonder, uh, you know, I look back now and I, I understand why and uh, just like going to college, it's a discipline, mm -hmm. and that's the, that's the key, the discipline. <coughs> so for us, it's just do the reading, uh, <laughs> right. in your case, it's make the bed right. Uh, okay. How long did basic training last? It was an eight-week course, okay. and uh, it was a lot of uh, in-class study, uh, learning about the flag, learning about the history of the Air Force, um, learning how to salute, how to march. Uh, it's uh, going through uh, the gas chamber and uh, shooting the M16. In that time, we shot the M1 rifle. Okay. The M16 hadn't come out yet. Yeah, I mean, the standard rifle <coughs> for the Army actually in 62 was going to be still the M14, which is an improved version. But you had the original World War II vintage M1s? Right, to start with, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, now, what was the gas chamber for? Uh, I, I really don't know. <laughs> it, again, that's probably the discipline, because you would go in there, they would turn the, the gas on, and uh, you would just stand there. It was tear gas. and. Um, they would uh, wait for you to beg to get out of there, and uh, everybody would be crying and yelling and screaming. And uh, finally, when they they know when you've had enough, mm -hmm. and uh, you'd run out of there, and you'd be eyes would be dry, uh, crying and. Uh, because sometimes when people talk about this in other branches of service, I mean, there's a gas mask they get to put on at some point. Right. But did you have that? Or? We, we did it at the very last minute. They get the gas mask put on, but it was still traumatic, you know. Yeah. Um, but it was part of that discipline. Okay. Now, had you already uh, selected what your training was, your, your specific training was going to be, or did they determine that once you were there? They determine that's one of the classes that you go through and in interviews and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I. Uh, I had assumed that I was going into electronics because I scored real high mm -hmm. in that. And uh, so I, at the end of basic training, they tell you where you're going to be going. And uh, mine was Amarillo, Texas for automatic pilot school. Okay. Uh, <coughs> and how long would you stay at Amarillo? I went through Amarillo. It was basically a um, a 28-week course. Okay. Um, and I got halfway through it, and there was a, a glitch in the paperwork somewhere, so I ended up in another class, and I finished that up. So I was there probably 32 weeks, and... Uh, finally got through it. Okay. What did the training there consist of? Again, it was uh, the dormitories, uh, the routine, keeping your dorm clean, um, spit shining your shoes, uh, inspection of your uh, uniforms, but then 
uh, during class time, you would go to school in the morning and they would teach you elec basic electronics and then they would go into your uh, primary automatic pilots. And, uh, but it was sort of like basic training with the regimentation going to uh, the KP in the, in the uh, cafeteria. Um, and then uh, we had more free time in, base, in uh, technical school on the weekends uh, as opposed to basic training. Okay, so what were the living conditions <coughs> like there? World War II dorms. Um, a lot of the, uh, the wall board was unpainted, but the, the dorms were spotless because we kept them that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, no air conditioning, but it was, you know, down in Amarillo, Texas, it, it gets kind of hot. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gets cold and hot, and so uh, we had our blankets and so on. But yeah. it, was, it was fairly good compared to what uh, I hear of the Army. Yeah. That would depend on where <coughs> you were with, with the Army, right. I think. But, uh, Nancy, you know, did you at least have stoves or heaters of some kind in the barracks? Yeah, it, it had furnaces. Okay. Yeah. And were you beyond the level of using coal, or were you? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was heated, but it was uh, old. Yeah, and probably not very well insulated or anything right, else. Right. Okay. Uh, and uh, so, what were you actually learning to do? And they're training you something with autopilots. Yeah, uh, you first learned electronics mm -hmm. and then you learned all about airplanes, the winnings and the fuselage and so on. And then uh, the autopilot system, the pilot flips a switch and it'll fly by itself mm -hmm. um, until it gets to a, uh, an airport and then it'll, uh, pilot lands it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it uh, pretty much took care of the airplane uh, in flight. So you're learning basically how it works and how to maintain it? Yeah, uh, changing servos that would uh, uh, put the ailerons in the uh, elevators in certain positions. And uh, at that time we were still using tubes, if I can remember mm -hmm. correctly. And uh, solid state had come at a, another time, mm -hmm. but um, we, learned uh, G-limit uh, monitors that uh, the aircraft would fly in a particular uh, attitude and um, if it went, took too many Gs, it would flip off the autopilot system and, and things like that that uh, we would learn. Okay, uh, now did you have, did you work with actual aircraft or just with the parts? In the uh, in Amarillo, we just learned the parts and uh, the the uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. We didn't go into the actual aircraft until we went to our new next base. Okay. Uh, now, at least in, until the last few weeks, were you pretty much with the same group the whole way through? Yeah, you were with a uh, class, mm -hmm. and uh, and then you were assigned to a dormitory and a squadron, a flight, and uh, we stayed pretty much as a team. Okay. Yeah. Now, when you went off the base, what did you do? Uh, down in uh, down in Amarillo, I had a, a chance to go out with my uh, lieutenant, ex executive officer. We went out to some of the ranches and we would explore uh, Indian ruins. And it was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'd never done that before out in uh, the deserts and uh, out in the um, pastures out mm -hmm. there on the ranches. We'd look for a circle of rocks, an old circle, and it would, uh, you'd sift through there and you'd contain uh, arrowheads. And, uh, it was pretty interesting. Okay. Uh, now, was it normal for officers and enlisted to hang out together off no. base? No. 
No, that was uh, forbidden. Okay. Uh, I think this uh, uh, relationship there was pretty much professional, mm -hmm. and uh, it's something that was done. I, I don't know how we ended up starting it, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, we both had the interest in archaeology mm -hmm. and so on, and uh, so that started that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, if you think back over the time uh, in Amarillo, are there any particular events or experiences or broader impressions that kind of stay with you? No, uh, other than uh, I remember that the, our drill sergeants would say, uh, you're welcome to go AWOL in Amarillo if you want, because uh, we could see you walking in Amarillo for four days and you'd still be seeing because it's so flat, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a, a big joke that uh, he could go AWOL. And okay. Uh, was there much to do in the town? I mean, was there much of a town there? Uh, well, at the time, uh, there was some parks, and we went out on uh, in some, there were some uh, rivers that we'd go to mm -hmm. and uh, just have a little fun at, but uh, it was mostly everything on base. Mm -hmm. so, did they have bars? Uh, I don't recall because I wasn't old enough. Okay. And they do on all, all of our bases. Mm -hmm. We have airmen's clubs, right. NCO clubs, and uh, officers clubs. Okay. So and, the drinking uh, age there was 21 at that point? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I wasn't much of a drinker to start with. Yeah. A good boy from West Michigan. Yeah. So of course yeah. not. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, all right. So you're there, okay, so that's like uh, close to eight months, I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then where do you go once you finish that course? Well, I got my orders, and uh, all of us as a, uh, team members, we don't necessarily travel to the next base. Mm -hmm. We all go out as individuals, and I think there was probably four of us that went to Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona. All right. And uh, that's where we learned our autopilot skills. Okay. Working with actual <coughs> aircraft now. Actual aircraft. We started with the F-100. That was called the lead sled, and they used that extensively in uh, Vietnam. All right. Now describe that aircraft a little bit. It was a, uh, one of the first what they call a Century Series aircraft, F-100. And... Uh, had a big nose to uh, for the intake on the on the jets, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, as far as my job, I we would lift up the hood on the on the aircraft, and our equipment was right inside. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, some of them had two seater uh, aircraft, and some were single. Mm -hmm. uh, we would go in have to lift the canopy up and go in and set in the in the canopy or in the cockpit there mm -hmm. and uh, play with our instruments with uh, the ones that we were in charge of. And that was interesting, setting on an ejection seat mm -hmm. uh, with the power on and uh, that was another thing that we learned about in school. Um, there's a separate class in that. Mm -hmm. uh, so you always want to be careful as to what levers you're pulling. All right. Now, did you ever get a chance to go up in an F-100? No, I didn't. No. Uh, I, the, the closest I got, we would run them, mm -hmm. and uh, the, we wouldn't run them, but the crew chief would run it, and then we would test our, uh, our system by right. running the ailerons and the mm -hmm. elevators and the rudders and making sure everything worked properly. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and how long did you stay at that base? I was there for about a year. And uh, one of the things I remember about Luke Air Force Base is you're at the, in the near the Mojave Desert, and uh, you'd get these uh, sand uh, storms coming through. You're out on the... Ex out on the uh, uh, runway and uh, 
there you can see from the distance the sandstorm. So you jump in the cockpit and you close, close the cockpit uh, canopy and, and there you set until the sandstorm runs over. It, uh, it's quite a, it was quite an experience. Okay. Now how was life on this base different from life while you were training? That uh, it, it completely different. You still had uh, dormitory inspections, mm -hmm. <coughs> probably a couple times a month, and uh, you had roommates, and you had a. Uh, we were in a two-man room. Uh, we were free to go uh, around the door, around the base. We had uh, first couple months we had to get permission to go off base and um, that was kind of a liberty mm -hmm. uh, thing uh, but on base you had the libraries you had the cafeterias the bowling alleys the uh, airmen's club and uh, there's plenty to do on an Air Force base okay and what kind of aircraft were you working with that was the F-100 only on, uh, okay. on the, uh, at Luke. Okay. And was there a particular squadron or wing that was based there that you were with, or were you? Yeah. Uh, I want to, uh, the Air Force is kind of different from the Army and the uh, and Marines. We were in, a, I was in an A&E squadron, Armament and Electronics, mm -hmm. they call it. Uh, I don't recall, 314th seems to be the, but uh, we were just members of that squadron, and we worked on the aircraft. Uh, but when we left the base, when we rotated to another base, we rotated again as individuals. Mm -hmm. we, the squadron didn't move from yeah. one to another. So the squadron was essentially part of <coughs> sort of the staff for part the base. Part of the base, yeah. yeah. And so you're just in, in that while, while right. you're there. Right. All right. Uh, now, so what year is this then that you're... This would be in 1963. Okay. So at this point, it's still um, uh, pre-Vietnam, although actually air assets are already yes. getting over uh, there. I had volunteered for Vietnam that, that year, mm -hmm. and uh, I was single, mm -hmm. so uh, I put in a volunteer statement and uh, nothing ever happened. And and then uh, the only thing that happened to me was I got engaged. Mm -hmm. And uh, from Luke Air Force Base, I was, I was reassigned to uh, the 33rd Tech Fighter Wing in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, mm -hmm. Eglin Air Force Base. During that time between Luke Air Force Base and going to Eglin Air Force Base, I got married. So I withdrew my Vietnam request. All right. Okay. Now at that point, for a while there, there was a rule that, that said that the married personnel didn't get sent overseas. Or then, right. and then later it was if you had children, you didn't get sent overseas. Right. And eventually all of those went away. But I think some of that depended on when you started. Mm -hmm. So you were early enough I was that, early. that those rules yeah. may just apply to you automatically right. and then be in place afterward. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so when, when did you go to Eglin then? In uh, uh, April of 65. Okay. Uh, we had just started a new uh, wing. That, it was an old wing brought up from uh, World War II. Mm -hmm. But uh, 33rd Tech Fighter Wing was the F-4C Phantom Jet. Mm -hmm. And that was the newest thing introduced to the Air Force. It was uh, brought over from uh, the Navy. The Navy had, had the F-4s. Mm -hmm. And we adapted them for the Air Force. And that became, that replaced the F-100 in Vietnam mm -hmm. and uh, became the the go-to aircraft. Okay, uh, and so for people who don't know a lot about that kind of thing, what separates the F-4 from the F-100? Uh, all the F-4 was all um, integrated systems, uh, uh, transistors and diodes, and uh, 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 all you you take a, a box out of the aircraft 
and you put in another box. Whereas in the F-100, we would take the box out of the aircraft, go to, back to the shop, fix it, put it mm -hmm. back in the aircraft. These were all, the uh, F-4 was all modular. Mm -hmm. Everything was uh, state of the art. Okay, and then in terms of just what the aircraft could do, what's the difference? Uh, the aircraft was much faster, uh, more maneuverable, the F-100, uh, like they called it, the lead sled, mm -hmm. it, had, uh, it had some good uh, bombing uh, capabilities, but the F-100 was able to carry more of a payload mm -hmm. and uh, was much faster and maneuverable. Yeah, the F-4 was, was much F4, faster. F-4, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Um, and as far as you were concerned as a mechanic, did working on the F-4 make the job easier, harder, or were oh, there it was, challenges? It was much easier. Uh, again, uh, it was a brand new, uh, brand new wing, mm -hmm. and so ever we were, uh, we even had to uh, build our our shops, and uh, everything was right from scratch. Uh, we were issued tools, new tools, and and uh, um, the maintenance. Uh, it was, we probably worked uh, four, three or four days a week because it was a brand new, mm -hmm. we didn't even have all of our airplanes in. Mm -hmm. um, so we were that new building up the, the uh, wing. Um, but working on the aircraft itself was, uh, we learned, had to learn all about it. We went to school because it was a brand new, mm -hmm. uh, Brand new thing to us. All right, uh, and then so you got engaged. So when did you get married? Got married uh, just before getting to Eglin Air Force okay. Base. Now at that point, uh, could you and your wife live off base, or how did, yeah. what was? It? Um, what we did is uh, we lived, had our honeymoon right there at Eglin Air Force Base, and then uh, she went back home. Okay. And I stayed there and, and uh, learned the job. Mm -hmm. We didn't plan on uh, living together until I got out of the Air Force in uh, a year from then. Okay. And uh, at, uh, in 66, when I got, before I got out, I had a choice of going with the, uh, the wing to Oslo, Norway, for a firepower demonstration mm -hmm. or getting out. And I decided to get out of the service. Okay. And from that point, from Oslo, then the wing went to, uh, not the wing, but the squad mm -hmm. uh, went to Vietnam. Okay. So I would have gone to Vietnam had I not gotten out of the Air Force. Okay, so at this point, the Air Force for you, that was just kind of one stage in your life and now you were moving on. Right. Okay. Uh, and so you go back to Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. So what year is that now? That's 66? That was in 66. Okay. Um, and once you got back to Grand Rapids, what did you do? I had the GI Bill, so I was able to, uh, I went down to Grand Rapids Junior College mm -hmm. and then I went over to Kendall School to design for a semester. And during all that time, I was uh, raising our first child and uh, going to work for Lear Siegler. Okay. And we were working seven days a week, 10 hours a day, doing almost the same job for Lear that I was doing in the Air Force. But with Lear, I was testing the equipment as opposed to actually using it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and, and so how long does that last? About a year, let's see, I, uh, a little over a year. In March of 68, mm -hmm. I got itchy feet and I wanted to go back into the Air Force. Okay. And so I had to get into the Air Force before my second child was born uh, because they had the restrictions. You couldn't go in with uh, more than two children or more than one mm -hmm. child. So I went in in March of 68. I went back into the Air Force. All right. Um, now, the, the climate in the country has changed quite a bit 
in, in that time. By the time you get into early 68, uh, you know, the Tet Offensive had, had started and uh, anti-war movement is ramping up and you have a lot of stuff kind of going on. Mm -hmm. You also have a lot of people who are trying to avoid the draft or at least stay out of the mm -hmm. Army or the Marines by trying to join the Air Force yeah. or, or, or the Navy. Uh, now, did you have a special status because you, were, you had prior service and training? No, other than I was prior service, mm -hmm. so uh, I was able to to keep my rank mm -hmm. uh, of uh, I believe I was E three, um, uh, Airman First Class, mm -hmm. and uh, so I went back in, but I couldn't get into autopilot systems, and I could get into electronics, and I went into what they call inertial navigation systems, okay. Doppler radar. Okay. And uh, so I had to go back to school at Keeser Air Force Base in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. and okay. Now, when you went down there, did your wife stay in Grand Rapids or did she come down? Uh, she traveled with me there. Okay. And uh, we got a, had a trailer to start with. And uh, I can remember moving into the trailer into this park and we were right on a bayou. And, uh, we had talked about the storms coming through, the hurricanes and so on, and uh, I asked the landlord, when was the uh, last hurricane or the highest water? Mm -hmm. And he pointed up on a tree, the water level, and it was above all the trailers there. <laughs> he said, that's been a while. And uh, so we were there, uh, like I said, on the bio, and we, my daughter, walked out to the dock, I can remember, and uh, there was a water snake that went right in front of her. And my wife saw that, and by the next day, she had packed up and went back to Michigan. Okay. So I was there for a while, for two or three months, uh, on my own, and until I finally got a house, mm -hmm. and we brought them back down. All right. Uh, now, how long were you at Keesler? Keesler was uh, from March of 68 till about, um, uh, till about 70. It was, uh, I got orders for Korea. Okay. And in the meantime, but was all of that schooling or were you now working on the base? I, I was uh, going to school for about six months. And because I had prior electronics experience, mm -hmm. I self-generated through the school and finished early. And then I was selected as an instructor mm -hmm. uh, for electronics. And so I became an instructor there for uh, probably a year. And uh, during that year, we had Hurricane Camille and I can remember if you lived off base and they had a hurricane, you had a choice of going onto base because of the security and, and the storm shelters and so on, or you could stay off, off base. We elected to stay off base in our house and we were far enough off the beach that we weren't gonna get flooded but I can remember looking out the window while Hurricane Camille was coming through and the eye of the storm passed just to uh, engulf Fort, just down from us. Mm -hmm. And I could look out the window and saw all the trees going one way and then an hour or so you could see the trees going the other way. And in the morning when we woke up, I had all, uh, all of us in the middle of the house. Mm -hmm. In the morning when I woke up, the nails in the woodwork were all out about a quarter of an inch from the house going back and forth. And, uh, did, uh, you, did you lose your windows or did they? Nothing was damaged. Okay. Uh, we had limbs and so on around, but I got out and I uh, drove down to the beach and on the highway was an ocean going vessel sitting there <laughs> and you could look down on the beach and there would be dead cows because far out on an island there was a dairy farm mm -hmm. 
and all those cows got washed onto wow. the beach. And there was uh, the water side of the highway was just leveled. Uh, the motels, the bars, uh, completely leveled. Okay. Is this Biloxi, Mississippi? This is in Biloxi. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, when something like that happens, the military often gets involved in cleanup and support and other things like that. So, right. Uh, we had gotten out uh, the Air Force Base. All the guys from the Air Force Base were assigned to different groups, and we would go out and police up the area and help in any way we could. And uh, probably the Air Force Base anywhere in the world. Uh, Army, Air Force, Marines, mm -hmm. there's, uh, they're there to help the communities, and uh, they certainly help Biloxi. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, are, are there other things that, that kind of stand out in your memory from that time, aside from the hurricane? Uh, that... Uh, I would say pretty much no. We raised uh, wire-haired terriers, but uh, Biloxi was uh, pretty much getting uh, family mm -hmm. family organized. Right. The kids were young. Mm -hmm. um, we were learning all about uh, military life, family life, and and so on. Uh, meeting yeah. new friends. Okay. So did you uh, just sort of socialize with other people who also had young kids and things like that? Was there some kind of network there? There was a camaraderie of that. Um, we learned that uh, when I was uh, in Florida, mm -hmm. we got together with young couples because we had the mm -hmm. one child. And uh, there's, uh, we had neighbors across the street from us that kind of took us in. They were older mm -hmm. and took us in and, and uh, showed us the ropes, uh, but met a lot of new friends, mm -hmm. and uh, I wish we had Facebook back then so I could keep track of them all, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. All right, now you're also in, in the South in the 1960s, and you'd come down from Grand Rapids, I mean, and you had a civil rights movement going, and there had been segregation and things like that. I mean, to what extent were you aware of any of that kind of stuff? Such naive kids. My wife and I, we had no idea that uh, there was uh, things like that going on. We grew up at Grand Rapids in a uh, uh, pretty much all-white school. We mm -hmm. had two or three black uh, students in our class and didn't think anything mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went down there and we saw these old shacks along the road, and uh, we didn't see any of the uh, uh, white and black. It was pretty much a community that uh, we didn't see any of that racism, mm -hmm. and so we didn't understand that that was really going on. Mm -hmm. um, so we were pretty much naive kids. Right. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, now, the orders for Korea, was that a surprise, or were you expecting something? Pretty much. Uh, like I said, in, in, uh, we all go into our individual play, uh, areas, mm -hmm. and there was uh, five of us out of the school, out of the uh, instructor school, that got orders. Uh, three of us went to Korea, and two of them went to uh, Vietnam. So I could have gone to Vietnam mm -hmm. very easily. <coughs> but uh, my um, assignment was Osan Air Base, Korea. Okay. All right. And how did they get you out to Korea? Uh, flew. Uh, we went from uh, uh, Washington, uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, Tacoma mm -hmm. uh, to uh, Korea. That was quite a long, long ride. You'd fly it into uh, Alaska, mm -hmm. and then from Alaska to Korea. Okay. And where is Osan in Korea? 
It's uh, below the 38th parallel. It's in probably the middle of South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a, uh, there's several air, air bases around there, but uh, Suwon and, and uh, Osan were pretty close together. Okay. All right. And now your job is essentially what you had. My, my job is a little different this time. Um, like I said, in, in Mississippi, I was working on Doppler radar, inertial navigation mm -hmm. systems. We had, I believe it was three or four CT-29s, and they were used strictly to monitor the DMZ zone. Um, so when they flew, uh, we didn't work. Mm -hmm. We worked when they, were, when they landed and if there was anything wrong, we would go uh, fix the, the Doppler radar. Okay. But if there's nothing wrong, we didn't work. And so we spent a lot of downtime in Korea um, not working. And uh, All right. the aircraft itself, was, was that propeller driven or a jet? It, it was propeller driven. It was a C-47, okay. or uh, I believe it was a C-47. Uh, the CT-29s, mm. it was a uh, above the C1, uh, C-23s. Uh, this was a four-engine turboprop mm -hmm. and uh, uh, camouflage paint and strictly used for uh, a recon on okay. the DMZ. So it had radar systems. Uh, so basically, it would fly over and try to monitor any kind of activity had, there. Had cameras, mm -hmm. uh, big cameras, and it'd take pictures of the DMZ. All right. Now, at that point in, in time, I mean, was there much tension there along the border? Were there incidents or things that happened in that period? Daily. Um, they would rake the beach every day. and. Um, you would walk down the street, and every intersection had a uh, uh, anti-aircraft uh, in, encampment there. They took it very serious. Um, you didn't uh, Koreans themselves wouldn't uh, wouldn't walk down the street without carrying an ID card. Um, the ID card was their freedom, and. Um, that uh, they took the North and South very serious. So they were always concerned about infiltrators or anything else like yeah, that? Yeah. You said rake the beach. Were you yeah, near? Uh, near uh, the, I, I think it's the Yellow Sea, China's. Uh, well, is it on the western side, south of Seoul, or were you on the other side? No, we were south of Seoul. Yeah. But uh, when, uh, uh, on the beach, they would rake it so they could tell whether somebody landed mm -hmm. or swam or however, and they could tell whether somebody was on the beach uh, infiltrated. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Uh, and now did you have Korean military personnel working with you at all? No, we had, uh, this was all Air Force. Okay. Um, and Back at Luke Air Force Base, we had civilians that would work with us, mm -hmm. but this was all Air Force. So. Okay, uh, but you still had contact with at least the civilian population in that area. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We have uh, our, I'm a pop son for our dormitories, and um, we would have uh, we'd go off base and uh, fraternize with the locals. Um, our big thing was going to the or orphanage. Uh, most every weekend, we'd take a Air Force vehicle and go to the orphanage, and uh, they would treat us like kings. We would play with the kids, mm -hmm. and then they would put on a little skit for us, and they would put a display of fruit and vegetables, mm -hmm. and we'd eat, and uh, just uh, it was very touchy the orphanages okay. there. And did you bring things to them or give them support of one kind or another? Uh, I don't think we brought anything to them. Um, there was, uh, 
it, it was more just going there and uh, playing with them, watching them, mm -hmm. them having somebody. Koreans love uh, to have a conversation with an American. Mm -hmm. They uh, they like that English, learning English conversation. That was uh, one big thing that stood out with me. Okay, and did some of the single guys have Korean girlfriends and things like that? Yeah, that was uh, that was part of uh, a lot of a lot of the uh, Orientals that you see in the states nowadays were from the uh, Korean and uh, Vietnamese and so on. Um, it would be a thing. Young ladies were uh, kicked out of their families at a young age, uh, 13, 14, 15. Uh, they had no use. Uh, these are stories that I've been told and that I've seen. Uh, the the uh, boys in the family could produce, they would farm and mm -hmm. so on, but the girls were not of too much use. So they were sent off to the city, big mm -hmm. city. <coughs> and uh, Mama San would take them in because they had no place to go. Uh, so Mama San would have them uh, work in their uh, club, uh, 10 bar, mm -hmm. waitress, and buy them clothes, feed them, give them a place to stay. And before you know it, the young lady is there for a year or two, and she owes Mama San several thousand dollars because the interest rate is so high, and she can never pay it off. So she's indebted. Mm -hmm. Mama San takes her ID card, and she can't go out onto the streets. And so she's pretty much an indentured slave right, mm -hmm. right there. So G.I. comes along and uh, meets her in the bar, and uh, they start seeing each other, and before you know it, he pays off Mama San and uh, buys her salvation, and then they move into a, a little hooch themselves and end up getting married. Yeah. Or not, probably. What's that? Uh, and uh, probably some of them don't get married. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, the ones that get married mm -hmm. are transferred to the States. Right. And uh, it's uh, a whole whole new story. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And I guess, when, and of course, some of them, they would wind up, they're working for Mama San, they wind up in prostitution in some cases. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. now, were there also drug problems at that time? I didn't see. Uh, I didn't. The only thing I can remember is a few of the guys would uh, smoke marijuana. Mm -hmm. But as far as drugs, uh, no. So heroin hasn't we, gotten there or no, anything like that? No, yeah. it, was, uh, it was pretty clean. Um, there was the venereal disease mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, but then the AIDS wasn't there yet. Right. And, uh, but uh, it was... <laughs> Pretty utopia. Um, you'd go to the, you'd go down to the village, and you'd go to the bars. You'd drink, have fun, go back to the dormitories. You have to be off the streets by ten o'clock at night, mm -hmm. and uh, if you weren't off the streets, then you would end up in uh, a hooch with a girl, mm -hmm. and uh, that would be your life saving until the morning when you could get back out onto the streets. Right. And did you learn to eat Korean food? Loved it. I was 185 pounds when I went to Korea. And when I left, I was 145. I ate everything. I'd go out to the farmers, uh, out to the farmland, mm -hmm. and they would be welcome you in. And you'd sit around the table and they have about uh, 10 different items. Uh, they just ate tremendously. Um, but it was uh, uh, dried fish, uh, kimchi, which was very hot, and uh, everything was uh, irrigated with human feces. Mm -hmm. And, <coughs> and uh, so you have to clean it real well. 
-hmm. And I would have all kinds of diarrhea and uh, uh, parasites and you name it. That, but I, I went out and I enjoyed it. Okay. Now, did you develop <laughs> any resistance to that stuff after a while? Or? Evidently, uh, I could go down to the village and uh, you'd go through the market and there would be squid, dried squid hanging. Mm -hmm. You'd pull a tentacle off and you'd eat it like rawhide, <laughs> you know, like uh, jerky. Mm -hmm. And um, you'd go in, I'd, I'd eat the octopus, and, uh, I'd eat it all. And you're I'd still pay alive. for it, yeah. <laughs> and I'd still pay for it, yeah. All right. Uh, <coughs> now, I take it you're, well, you were in Korea. Your family was still back in the States. Right. right? That was yeah. an unaccompanied tour. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, so how long total did you spend in Korea? Thirteen months. Okay. I did uh, come home for Christmas and uh, saw my, grand my son for the first time he was uh, talking. Mm -hmm. Boy, that really tore me up. Now, now when, when you got back, I mean, did, did he know who you were? Yeah. Good. Because yeah. he Just, wasn't afraid of you. Yeah. We kept in touch, uh, you know, through telephone and uh, letters and so on. Okay. Now, when you called home, uh, could you just use a regular phone line for that? Or yeah. was there, okay, so yeah. it wasn't like in Vietnam where you had to have a ham radio operator in right. the middle or whatever. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, looking at your sequence, I thought one of the things that you did before Curry was you spent some time as an Air Force recruiter. Yeah, that was, uh, you're right. Uh, <laughs> we went from, uh, well, we went from... Uh, uh, Eglin? Mrs. Uh, from uh, Eglin to uh, how did we go? Or was it? Or did uh, you go from Mississippi to Grand Rapids? Went from Mississippi uh, to Korea. Okay. And then from Korea to Grand Rapids as an Air Force okay. recruiter. And was that your first stint as a recruiter? Yes. Okay. It was. Uh, so before we get there, uh, other things that stand out in your memory from time in Korea. Um. Pretty much the orphanages, the, uh, I did fly on the CT-29 and we mm -hmm. were able to fly along the DMZ and uh, the pilot and navigator told us what he was doing, showed mm -hmm. us everything. That was a, a very interesting. Um, but uh, the life in Korea uh, was pretty much on base, um, working, uh, we went to, we, we met some college students from Korea, and they were just interested in talking. Mm -hmm. they, want, they want, in the most way, to learn conversational English. Right. And so uh, we did that. And, uh, did you go into any of the larger cities, like Seoul or any place? Oh, uh, <laughs> I was in Seoul with a friend of mine. We, we walked... Uh, we were walking down the street in Seoul and uh, just enjoying looking at different sites and so on. And all of a sudden, uh, we went into this tea house and uh, the lady told us, uh, you know, you're not supposed to be in this area. And it was in a trucking area. Mm -hmm. And I guess it was off limits to either uh, United States uh, uh, U.S. people, or it was off limits to military, mm -hmm. and so we scurried out of there real quick. Had no idea. We just mm -hmm. walked, enjoyed, uh, and uh, so that was our uh, tour in Seoul. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we, you go back and forth on a bus, a military bus. Okay. Now, were there ever actual, any actual incidents involving you know, North Koreans or people trying to get on your base or anything else like that? No, it was pretty much uh, peacetime, uh, nothing to write home about. Okay. You know? All right. Uh, so you have you finished Korea, now you get to go back to Grand Rapids, and now you're working as an Air Force recruiter. Mm -hmm. And now this is like early 1970s here. Um, Okay, so describe, what, what was that like? Uh, being an Air Force recruiter was one of the proudest moments, uh, proudest times in my career. Um, I was uh, 
went to Lackland Air Force Base for recruiting school, and then I came home, and I was assigned to uh, Allegan County, uh, South Kent County. I had several, uh, about 20 schools mm -hmm. that I would go to each. Uh, I would make my rounds of all the schools. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the big thing that stands out is uh, some of the teachers and counselors that I had met complimented me on the fact that I would go to the school and uh, present myself and ask to see so-and-so uh, uh, student mm -hmm. to recruit. And uh, unlike the other military services, they would come in and they would demand this and demand that, and I want to see this person, that person. Mm -hmm. But mine was a low-key approach, and I made a lot of friends with the uh, counselors. Friends that I have today, I mm -hmm. even bowl with one <laughs> that um, I talked talk to about going into the service, and he ended up joining the Navy as an officer. Mm -hmm. So um, these are the types of friendships and, and things that I did as an Air Force recruiter. Okay. Now, did you encounter any kind of anti-war sentiment or would there be people in some of these places who were hostile to you because you no, were recruiting? I, I always, and this was in the, the height of Vietnam, um, I was always proud to walk around with my uniform mm -hmm. and I had never been harassed. Mm -hmm. Uh, except one time I went into South Christian High School and there was a very liberal female teacher that said something about mm -hmm. it. And her other teacher, they said, just ignore her. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, but that was the only thing that stood out because I'd, I'd never been harassed, never been spit on. Um, mm -hmm. Well, this was not exactly a hotbed of radicalism, right. uh, especially outside of the city of Grand Rapids itself, probably. You right. would not encounter a lot of that too much. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, what kinds of things motivated people to join the Air Force at that point? Um, jobs and schooling. Uh, the, uh, when I was there, the, my first tour, um, women were being accepted into the uh, military to do uh, non-female uh, non roles. Mm -hmm. um, I had put in the first jet engine uh, aircraft mechanic that was a female. Mm -hmm. Beautiful little girl from Wyoming, uh, Wyoming High School. And um, she, she was a model. I mean, she was just Gorgeous, and I said, "You want to go in a uh, jet engine?" Yeah, I want to do something that uh, is that women don't do. Mm -hmm. So she did go into the Air Force, and she did go into jet engine mechanics. And after about three years, she says, "I'm tired of being one of the guys mm -hmm. and getting grease under my fingers." And so the Air Force offered her any job. She was qualified for everything. She, mm -hmm. she scored high. And she decided that, no, I'm going to get out. And so they offered, you know, one or the other. She decided to get out. And uh, to this day, she had, I still see her from time to time. Mm -hmm. And she says, I wished I had stayed in. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the, the type of person I think that I was putting in the Air Force I have a, a log uh, scrapbook that mm -hmm. when they come back on leave, and I encourage them to stop in and see me, I have them sign in and take a picture and uh, see how they're doing. Several of my recruits have retired from the Air Force, and uh, the ones that uh, stayed in for four, they said, uh, it was a great time. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot, but I'm not going to do it again. Mm -hmm. You know. Now, at this point, did you have some people who were doing this to stay away from the draft? Uh, uh, yes, but most of them were. Uh, I would say 
most of them I recruited myself. Mm -hmm. uh, they they didn't necessarily come into my office to get out of the draft. Okay. But, uh, yes, some of them were motivated to to do that, but most of them were coming in to look for a job. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh, how many people would you get in a month? Did you have quotas? or I had quotas. We would have uh, maybe four or five uh, men uh, a month, and then uh, they started putting quotas on us for the females. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did very well, in. Uh, I think I won an award for uh, Recruiter of the Month mm -hmm. for female. They also had prior service quotas, and uh, a lot of the prior servicemen that I put in, uh, I still see today mm -hmm. and communicate with them today. Um, the uh, quotas were met without any problem. The Army, Navy, they would always, we were in the same offices mm -hmm. all together. And, uh, would always see if they had any anybody that I could give them. Mm -hmm. um, and we did. A lot of the kids that didn't qualify for us, we'd send them over to the Navy and the Army and the Marines. Yeah, I guess how tough were the rules or the expectations? Our, our, expe our expectations on qualifying mentally mm -hmm. were strict. Um, we would require on the Air Force qualifying test a score of at least, I believe it was 31. I'm not exactly sure. But the Army and, and the Marines could go down uh, a couple points, mm -hmm. and so we had send them over. Uh, physically, if they didn't pass our physical, they pretty much couldn't pass the physical for the other okay. services right. either. And, uh, did you have people who didn't pass the physical who'd go away, get in better shape, and come back? Yeah. I uh, had a young lady that uh, had to lose her weight, and she lost it, and she's retired. Mm -hmm. uh, stayed in. I just communicated with her uh, a few weeks ago on Facebook. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay. Uh, now, how long did that first stint in Grand Rapids last? Four years. Okay. It was a four-year tour. At the end of it, I was the... Uh, tester. I would travel around the West Michigan up to Traverse City and give uh, the ASVAB, mm -hmm. Armed Service Vocational Aptitude Battery, right. to schools, uh, to the Air Force offices, to uh, give the test to the students. Okay. Uh, now, do you, did, they, did the Air Force just rotate you out of that assignment, or did you ask for something different? No, it was a, a normal rotation. And uh, from there, I was assigned to Arkansas, okay. Little Rock, Arkansas. All right. And what were you going to do there? I was working on C-130s in my inertial navigation Doppler mm -hmm. radar. Okay. And uh, it was uh, like a duck out of water, uh, going from recruiting back into the maintenance mm -hmm. and. Uh, that time, uh, they went from uh, transistors to solid state. Uh, they hadn't gotten into uh, what they have today yet, but uh, so it wasn't computerized yet. It it was. We were always computerized. Mm -hmm. We had kind of like an analog computer as okay. opposed to the digital mm -hmm. age. Um, Looking back at uh, looking back at uh, um, Little Rock was uh, it's it's still old school electronics, mm -hmm. but uh, the C-130 aircraft is is still going today, and it was a workhorse in Vietnam, and uh, that's what. Uh, that's what we use. Yeah. So that's the big cargo plane. Yeah. Okay. Now, were some of the C-130s fitted with extra equipment? Because a C-130 can do different things. It can. We used it strictly for cargo. Okay. Um, All right. Uh, and now, did you have to learn new technology or 
upgrades from what you had worked with before? Uh, pretty much, I just learned it through the squad, uh, through the shop. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was assigned uh, to work with a few guys, and uh, we learned the C-130. Um, we had a, a classroom set up for a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay. Now, what rank were you at this point? I was a staff sergeant, uh, E-5. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you come in and you join this particular group, you, you have some seniority? You're yeah, I was uh, in charge. Of, I had uh, two or three people under me that uh, would work. Uh, okay, now did your family move with you to Little Rock? The family was with me. Uh, took the dogs and the kids and uh, jumped in a, I think we took a U-Haul uh, to uh, Little Rock mm -hmm. and got a house. We lived on base, uh, so that was kind of nice. Now, was there a school on the base or did yeah, the kids go on, off base? on base housing and uh, they had uh, a school right on the base and uh, some of the high school kids would go off base, but there was a, a elementary school on base. Mm -hmm. All right, and how long were you there? Uh, a year, about a year and a half. And um, one of the things that uh, I, I forgot about was I was a bowler. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started, uh, I've always been a bowler all my life, but in uh, 1972 when I was a recruiter, I started uh, getting active in bowling. Mm -hmm. And I was a, a junior bowling coach. My daughter was uh, uh, one of my students, one of my bowlers. And I became active in the association, the bowling association and he became a director mm -hmm. of the Grand Rapids Bowling Association. So when I went to Arkansas, I was a junior bowling coach there because all of our Air Force bases have bowling centers and uh, entertainment like that. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the, a bowling center on an Air Force base is the community center that everybody goes to. to mm -hmm have coffee, to eat, to socialize, and so on. And uh, so in Arkansas, I uh, was a junior bowling coach and then uh, became a member of the their association board. And this is where I met a lot of people that uh, I would be uh, eventually stationed with in another base. Okay. And, uh, so in Arkansas, uh, we went out to the diamond mines in, in Arkansas, one of our uh, things to do, activities. And uh, I did a, a lot of metal detecting out there. Uh, besides our, we, in the Air Force you work about eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have Saturdays and Sundays off unless, uh, there's uh, activities, um, so uh, that's how I sold the Air Force too. Mm -hmm. As a recruiter, was it was like a, a job, full time job that uh, you're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but you only work just like a normal, mm -hmm. a normal job. Okay, uh, now what brought the Arkansas assignment to an end? Uh, from there, we went to, uh, I went to Omaha, Nebraska for a school to learn, uh, to learn the uh, KC-135, and we were on our way to Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I learned the KC-135, that's a big Air Force tanker. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I was going to be working on in Okinawa. Okay. So when do you get to Okinawa? Uh, that, uh, I went there in 77. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, from 77 to 80. And okay. there I had my family, and we were able to bring our dog, and uh, flew over with the family on a big 747. Mm -hmm. And that took quite a while. Because yep. remember, the kids laid out the 77, uh, some, uh, 747, yeah. 47 was empty in the back, so we were able to put all the armrests out and we'd sleep on the eight seats across. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was quite a quite an experience. Okay. So what base were you at at Okinawa? We were at Kadena Air Base. And uh, overseas they call them air bases mm -hmm. as opposed to Air Force Base right. in the United States. And uh, we went, uh, got to Kadena and we had a little uh, house off base and met a helicopter pilot as our neighbor and became real good friends with them and uh, did a lot of hanging out. Again, he was an officer and I was an enlisted mm -hmm. man, but uh, it, uh, the fraternization there was, we were neighbors, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so eventually we moved on base to a brand new house uh, on, on a hill and uh, it was pretty neat. Um, Everything is made of concrete because of the psych, uh, the typhoons. Right. And um, spent uh, three and a half years on Okinawa, and uh, kids went to American school there, and uh, we worked KC 135s. Okay. So, what were you doing in your regular job then? Uh, we'd uh, go out and we'd uh, work on the uh, on the airplanes. The pilots would fly them, and if there was any anything wrong with them, they'd write it up, and we'd go out and uh, take care of the write-ups. Go back to the shop. Were you still working mostly with radar systems? Or? Yeah, okay. I'd be working with the Doppler radar, and. Uh, and was this basically the same that you'd had on the C-130s in yes. Arkansas? Okay. Pretty, pretty much the same. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, and your, what was the relationship between the Americans and the, and the locals in Okinawa? Very, very good. Uh, the only trouble we ever had was uh, a few of the people would be against the B-52s coming into land. Mm -hmm because they were nuclear uh, capable. Right. And uh, we had the SR-71. Uh, and there was a, f a few protesters. But mm -hmm. other than that, uh, Okinawa is a small island, about 15 miles long and about two miles wide. And we were there for three and a half years, mm -hmm. you know, just enjoying it. It was like, uh, subtropical, mm -hmm. uh, not as tropical as Hawaii, but uh, this is where all the mainland Japanese would come and honeymoon and, mm -hmm. and visit. Uh, it was just a wonderful place. Okay. Um, all right. So, and of course this is all now, this is all post-Vietnam, so right. you don't have you know, Cold War tensions or not really high at this point. No, Iran was uh, one of the yeah. one of the problems there. Um, matter of fact, one of our uh, one of our squadrons uh, was lost in uh, in the Iran when they went to um, uh, rescue the hostages, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, I was involved in bowling again. Mm -hmm. And I was the island secretary treasurer of the Okinawa Bowling Association. So we had an intramural squad, uh, a bowling league. And uh, one day, one of, the, one of the teams was gone. And that was the team that went to uh, Iran to rescue the hostages. And it was all top secret. Mm -hmm. We didn't know a lot of it, but you know, the word gets around. 
Because I guess what there was that that was the sort of failed attempt to get in there and rescue. I think it was a heli collision of helicopters. Yeah. I think yeah. so. It was a helicopter unit or whatever that you yes. lost. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so that was the uh, the era of uh, when we were there. Right. And how old were you? Were your kids by the time you left? Uh, let's see, in 77, 80, uh, my daughter was 14 and my son was uh, uh, 12. Okay. And uh, from there, we went to recruiting duty. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And was that back in Grand Rapids again? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But back in Okinawa, uh, again, my, it seems like my, uh, career had a dual career with the Air Force and bowling. Mm -hmm. uh, on Okinawa, I was the island secretary treasurer, like right. I had said before. But we had seven bowling centers in Okinawa, on the Marine base and the Army base. Mm -hmm. And once a year, I had to have to go to all of those bases and inspect the pins, the lanes. The uh, that's what I did, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so everything was geared around bowling. My commander and myself and my wife and, and his wife, we vacationed together. We bowled together on four different leagues. And uh, my commander was a, a major and mm -hmm. we still our friends today. Um, he got called on the carpet a few times for fraternizing. Mm -hmm. but. It's something that we did. Yeah. Our, our kids and their kids uh, vacation together on the re at, uh, at the, recre uh, the recreation site on Okinawa, and um, so we did. Yeah. All right. Well, I've mm -hmm. always had the impression that, that the Air Force was at least a little more casual about that than the other branches. Yes. But they they still frowned on it, though. Right. Right. It was uh, kind of an unwritten rule. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, as, as long as you don't get involved with uh, the military operation mm -hmm. and uh, insubordination right. and so on. Okay. Uh, now, you had talked earlier about uh, helping recruit women into the, some of these different occupations. So when you were in Arkansas or Okinawa, were there women in any of your teams at this point? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was in charge of a uh, young lady that was in Doppler radar with me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and several, several women were uh, out there on the flight line uh, pulling uh, aircraft equipment around and uh, being a gen mechanic and being an aircraft mechanic, being a cop. Um, that's one thing that women weren't allowed to do at one time. And uh, I put several of them in as uh, security policemen. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, were you aware of any issues of harassment or other kinds of problems because they were women, uh, or was that not on your radar? No. Uh, again, it was kind of a unique thing, new thing. And I would imagine I didn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you always do uh, know that the, some of the old timers, women aren't allowed in here and mm -hmm. so on. But uh, it was never out in the open. Okay. Uh, if somebody didn't like it, they kept it to themselves. Mm -hmm. Or if it was happening, it wasn't getting reported <coughs> to you. Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, so now you're going back. <coughs> now, would <coughs> the Grand Rapids recruiting assignment would be the la would that be the last thing you did? Or? That's the last thing I did, and uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get into Grand Rapids. I was mm -hmm. assigned to Kalamazoo. Okay. So uh, for a year, I was in Kalamazoo and uh, kept fighting my way to get mm -hmm. back to the Grand Rapids office. But I would travel from Grand Rapids to Kalamazoo every day because mm -hmm. um, I had a house that we bought when I was a recruiter the first time. Mm -hmm. And we just rented that out while mm -hmm. I was gone. Right. Yeah. OK. Uh, now. So you do this for about four years in four Michigan years. again? OK. Uh -huh. uh, now, what leads you to retire out of the Air Force? Well, my kids were in high school. And I had an option of going somewhere else. I didn't know where. Mm -hmm. But going somewhere else or retiring. 
And I thought as long as the kids now were in high school, they had had friends before when we were there in, mm -hmm. in uh, 72. And so I wanted to keep stability there. Right. They were, they were good uh, in every school that they went to in the military. Mm -hmm. They adapted well. But uh, I thought it was time that uh, we just settled down. Okay. And then did you find a job, a civilian job then? I changed my uniform on Friday and put on my suit on uh, Monday and sold real estate. Okay. And this is where I met Bill Schrader and uh, my... So what, what led you into, <clears throat> into real estate? Bill Schrader. I was in, a, uh, in the office, the recruiting office, and Bill, being the military guy that he is, mm -hmm. he, uh, he would come into the office and he would talk to me, I'm in real estate now, you want to get into it? So mm -hmm. him and I got into I got into real estate with him in another office, and uh, you know, we became friends from that point on. All right. Uh, so I guess when, when you look back now over your, your service career, uh, what do you think you took out of that, or how did that help to shape you? Uh, definitely uh, made a man out of me, like they all say, going into the military, make a man out of you. Um, the, the probably the biggest uh, influencer and so on is bowling. Um, I bowled a lot in the Air Force, mm -hmm. as I had uh, explained. And uh, after I sold real estate, I bought a bowling center. I, went, I graduated from uh, Davenport College mm -hmm. the same year I retired from the Air Force. Okay. And the Air Force paid three quarters of my tuition all the way through 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I finally retired, or finally uh, graduated, graduated yeah. from Davenport College. And uh, I did a, a business plan on a bowling center. And not knowing that I was going to buy one, and six years later when I retired, I sold a real estate. And then I went uh, in 1990, bought a bowling center. And uh, one that I grew up in. And. Uh, so which, which one is that? Paragon Bowling Center in Burton Heights. Okay. Is that still up and running? It's still up and running. I've remodeled it from the early retro 1945 mm -hmm. era to uh, present. And uh, I had it for 16 years, sold it in 2006. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I just uh, drive Uber, work for the Christmas light show. Mm -hmm and uh, metal detect. I'm a ring finder. Very good. All right. Well, the whole thing makes for a pretty good story and, and definitely a distinctive one. So thank you very much for coming in and sharing. Yeah, I appreciate it.